every time I try and preamble what the next session is going to be about, uh, I feel that I'm caught in hyperbole. But uh, Europe and what has been happening in Europe over the last few years is certainly something that, like, pretty much like the Arab Spring, has cascading effects across the world. This year, the European, Commission won, uh, the, the European Union won the Nobel Prize, but it is also in an extremely vulnerable state where it could fall apart. What does its economic crisis mean? What does its political vulnerability mean? If it falls apart, what will it mean for the world? To discuss that is an extremely eminent European economist, Nicholas Veron, James Crabtree, uh, a journalist with the Financial Times, and Vikram Chandra, a senior editor and anchor with NDTV. Please welcome them on stage. Well, welcome for, uh, and thanks for joining us for this. For the last year or so, the discourse in India has been so focused on the question of corruption that there's been very little time to look outside, look beyond India, look what's happening in places like Europe. We do have the challenge in this panel to turn the attention from corruption to the really tectonic changes that are happening elsewhere in the world. So let me start straight by diving into it. Is Europe going to survive? <laughs> uh, Europe means a number of things. Um, so there's a European economy, and will Europe prosper? It's a very wealthy part of the world. Will it continue to be wealthy or will it decline? So the European Union as a project of political integration, supranational, voluntary political integration based on consent, creating political and legal structures, a European Parliament, a rule of law through the European Court of Justice that are binding on sovereign member states. And then there is a Eurozone, which is a more advanced economic and monetary union with a single currency, which started 13 years ago, and which is currently in the midst of uh, intense uh, pressure. I'll answer your question. I think the, the, the Eurozone will survive, but we cannot be sure, because we're at a time of very high uncertainty. Things are happening in Europe which, frankly, were not predicted and arguably could not have been predicted in terms of the polit sheer political volatility that we're seeing in the past few months uh, as a result of the crisis. And I think it's going to be a tough time for Europeans. They will have to change a number of the ways they think, uh, they think about themselves and they think about what they are entitled to. In a way, Europe has been on top of the world for, say, 300 years. Then it, has to, it had to share leadership with the US for, say, a century. Now they have to adapt to a new world, a new geography. So I think it, it's going to be tough. I'm optimistic that this can be overcome relatively successfully. There's a price that will be paid for the inaction of the past few years and probably the lack of sufficient action of the next few years. But uh, I don't think the euro is doomed. I think it's still time to reform what needs to be reformed to ensure the sustainability of this pioneering experiment in uh, supranational uh, pooling of our destinies. Right. James, when you, when you look at this from the outside and you know, so sitting in, in India looking at Europe, uh, it seems to have been a bit of a roller coaster ride. You read one week, all right, that's <laughs> it. Your, Europe's packed up. You know, they, they can't save this. Next week, they found a solution. They found a package. Everything is going to be okay. Though next week again, uh, it's, it's over. It's, it's history. It's enough to make you a bit seasick. So, <laughs> if you could wrap up for us, what the actual position on the ground right now is. Well, I mean, I think people in India are fortunate in one sense, because at least when your country, which is a continent, is screwed up, you can blame corruption, whereas the Europeans can't do that. Our, our economy is relatively uncorrupt, and yet it's still a complete mess. I mean, so where are we? In the short term, things in Europe have got slightly better. The crisis has abated a little over the last couple of months. Uh, that's partly because uh, Germany has decided that it would be too expensive to let Greece leave. Angela Merkel went to Greece in a sort of symbolic uh, gesture. Um, so the, the likelihood of a Greek exit has declined, added to which the European Central Bank has guaranteed a whole bunch of money. And that has meant that in the short term, things look a little bit better. But in the medium term, I rather disagree with Nikolai in, in one sense. I mean, I think things are looking much worse for the ultimate solution, 
And the, the difficulty here is, or rather the easy thing, is everybody knows what the answer to this crisis is. The answer is that Germany must pay for the debts of the other countries, and that's the bargain that needs to be made. But the circumstances in which that can happen are getting much, much more difficult. Um, the Greek, Spanish, and Portuguese economies are all going to decline this year. The Eurozone is in recession. Um, uh, George Soros, about two years ago, I, I remember being told by a colleague in, in one of the sort of private meetings about what on earth do we do about this. People laid out the answer, which is, you know, Germany pays, we mutualize our debts. And he said, do it now, because it's only going to get harder. And that's the problem. The, 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 the political reality on the ground is getting worse as the economies of the Eurozone gets worse. And so that, I think, is the question, is, is it now possible to do this political deal in which Germany and a few other northern European countries pay for the debts of the southern European countries? And I, I, I think I'm a little more pessimistic than Nicola. I suspect it will happen, but I think it's going to be a pretty close-run thing. You know, when he, he was saying that in India it's slightly easier, we can blame it all on corruption. Well, yes, partly what we actually prefer to do is blame it on the politicians. <laughs> much simpler, much easier, and everyone buys it. Is that partly what's happening in Europe as well, that um, most of the countries, uh, being a democracy, is they find it difficult to do the things that they know need to be done. I'm sure the Greeks know what they should be doing. It's tough to push through austerity, as they're finding out. I'm sure the other countries in Europe also know what needs to be done but it's not always easy to find the political will. I don't think actually we know exactly what needs to be done because there is an experimental nature to European integration. We know how nation states work. We know we need a parliament. We know we need a, a justice system. Uh, we know the checks and balances. It's been a long discovery process, by the way. When the US created their constitution, they invented something completely new. They didn't know whether it would work. Actually, many people believed it was wrongly engineered and it wouldn't work. Um, so the European Union is not going to be a super state. It's not going to be a country even like India, and India is a complex country. Um, it's something loser. It's experimental. We don't know exactly how to do it. So when people created the euro, they were fully aware of the shortcomings of the policy framework they were creating. It had been diagnosed that, you know, you couldn't have a stable currency without a fiscal union, without a banking union. What did we do? We had a stability and growth pact, which was a very poorly designed, very weak form of fiscal framework. We didn't have a banking policy framework at all. Banking supervision remained completely at national level. People knew it was not sustainable, so they didn't predict that the crisis would be so disruptive and so difficult to solve. So I don't think we have a single fix out there. You know, Germans pay a check to Greeks and crisis over. Actually, that's what the markets anticipated before the crisis. This is why the borrowing rates of Greece were so low, because all investors thought, you know, Germany will pay the check because it's in their self-interest. And in a way, it was in their self-interest. Now, the political realities are much more complex. So if we think in, of this crisis only in terms of the quick fix, which is what policymakers in Europe have tended to do in the past five years, until recently, I think things are improving now in terms of grasping the sheer complexity of it all. If we think of a quick fix, we'll, we'll fail. It's not just that it's political conditions are not there. It's that to resolve this crisis, we have to completely change the way we think about the way we make policy in the Eurozone. We have to change um, patterns of accountability, which have to change uh, patterns of decision-making, it's, it's, it's not going to do, be done in one step, even assuming the political will was there. You know, I guess part of the problem is that, you know, it's all easy, very easy to say that Germany should pay the check to the Greeks. So I guess the question is, how many checks need to be paid? It's not just a question of Greece. There are other countries as well, whether it's Portugal or Spain. Some people even say Italy, France. Is, is, this, is this a bigger problem than just Greece? Germans are right to say, you know, if we write a check, we'll have to write another check. It's not sustainable. So what we need is something that binds us together in a different way and creates responsibility and accountability uh, for everybody. And the good thing about Germany is that they've learned a lot of things from history, from very painful history. I mean, Germany has inflicted a lot of harm on others during the 20th century, but that has harmed themselves as well. They have learned the hard way through complete destruction in the mid-20th century that 
uh, leadership so should not be about dominance. So they're very afraid of being thrusted into a position of dominance, and they're right to be afraid of it. So it's a bit about playing on German guilt and making <laughs> sure that, you know... You know, I think, really I, I think the guilt is largely gone now because the generation has gone. You know, nobody that is in a position of power in Germany had any responsibility individually uh, for what happened during the first half of the 20th century. So I, I wouldn't call it guilt. I would call it awareness, learn the hard way through collective experience, that domination is not good, that you have to share something with the people with, with whom you live uh, on the European continent. And I think this feeling is held more responsibly in Germany than in other parts of the world, but there is a, uh, of Europe, sorry, uh, but there is also a very um, deep reluctance uh, to look at the interdependencies uh, the way they are right now in the context of the very immediate crisis we have. So Germany, in a way, has the right long-term vision. They think about the long-term issue the right way, but they, they find it difficult to face the very short-term issues created by the crisis. You know, one of the questions that I, I think people are going to be asking is that the EU itself, he said it's an experiment, but is it a construct that by its very nature is almost doomed to failure? The fact that you have a monetary union but no fiscal union, you have different political nations out there, you have the possibility that every individual government has to fight its own elections while still worrying about a greater good. I mean, I, I think if you're sitting here in India um, wondering why I should care about the Eurozone crisis, given that it appears to be a bunch of feckless rich countries that just can't get their act together, I don't <laughs> I don't know if anyone else can hear me over this, this wine. Um, I mean, the first reason is that if this... Um, One sec, we'll just pause for a second. Ah, it's gone off. I'm sorry, there was a fire alarm set off by someone smoking, so I just wanted to reassure everyone. Ah, Should we okay. continue? Ah, it's gone. Okay, fine. Um, you know, the, 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 this collection of feckless, wealthy countries that can't get its act together, the, the, partly the reason is because if... Um, if if something bad happens in Europe, if now it looks like Spain, if Spain goes down, it will have ripple effects around the entire world. I mean, you only have to look at India's financial markets this year to see that most of the time they're driven by what's been being done by the European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve. But at a more fundamental level, I mean, you're right. Europe is an experiment in a way that we all could live in the 21st and 22nd century. There is a, a, an academic and diplomat called Robert Cooper, who called it the rise of a postmodern world order after the end of the Cold War, where he said you divided now the world into three parts. You had the pre-modern world, which was countries like Somalia or Afghanistan, which had no order or recognizable state. You then had the modern world, which would include India or China, which was sort of old, I don't want to say old-fashioned, traditional states. And then you had Europe and other international institutions which were a radical departure from anything that we'd almost ever seen in human history, where states allowed each other to interfere in their own affairs. Famously in Europe, you know, the curvature of bananas, the length of cucumbers, the sort of type of sausages and beer that you can sell, is no longer something that is purely a national issue, but which had allowed, um, you know, the European continent that had been riven by war for centuries to exist peacefully, for 60 years um, and will, I think, continue to do so. Now, if this experiment fails, given the challenges that every other country, face, every other country faces in the 21st century, given the global public goods which need to be provided, if this experiment fails, I think it paints a pretty bleak picture for the, the centuries to come and the type of competition that you're going to see between countries. Only look at what's now happening between Japan and China, for instance. So I think Everybody in Asia, you know, in the developing world has a stake in seeing whether the Europeans can get their act together because if, if we can't, you know, if the French and the British and the Germans can't get their act together, then I think it paints a pretty bleak picture for everybody else. Well, I'll, I'll give you another reason why whatever happens in Europe should be of great interest to us in India because in many ways the sort of experiments that we are trying here in India are not entirely dissimilar. India is also an extremely diverse, extremely complex country. As many languages, as many religions, as many cleavages. Uh, India has also been trying to keep together, and perhaps that's one of the great miracles of the 20th, uh, the 20th century. Do, to that extent, the challenges that you're seeing in Europe will resonate here in India as well. 
I think it's a great comparison because actually when you look at Europe, India sort of same land mass, India has more people, but not by an order of magnitude. And there is a similar level of diversity. Actually, I would say India is by most measures most, more, diverse, more, more diverse than Europe. Um, and the thing is, of course, the institutions are different, uh, partly because of the history of India uh, and uh, because of what happened at the time of independence. You have institutions of a unitary nation state in these countries that Europe doesn't have. But if you look simply at the di diversity, I see it as a source of hope for Europe because it shows that the cultural or historical or linguistic diverse or economic diversity of Europe is not per se an obstacle to finding a much more stable form of political organization. We, we're not at that point yet, clearly, but, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's feasible. Now, of course, it will be a different path from India, uh, and I think India will also have to learn from other parts of the world, including Europe, on how to think about the centralization, decentralization. We have spoken in the previous, uh, we have heard in the previous session about the, you know, the balance between regional parties, national parties. This is very relevant to Europe right now. Europe really doesn't have national pan-European parties. There are groupings of parties at the European Parliament, but this doesn't count as a single party. So, so we have a lot of, to learn from each other, and I think it's new in a way because India has emerged on the global scale in a way that makes it possible to have these comparisons which were much more difficult, I think, to think about uh, 20 years ago, say. I think in Europe also there is something new which parallels India, which is the fact that the English language now is a common form of communication for all Europeans, which was clearly not true uh, 20 years ago. So uh, lots of interesting parallels there. Mm. There's, there's also a sense of uh, a strange new phenomenon that's developing in Europe that even countries that have been together for decades, if not centuries, they now talk of separatism taking place. We're going to see this referendum in Scotland. Yeah. We're seeing it in Belgium. With, you know, in, we're seeing it in Spain with the Catalans uh, potentially asking for independence. So at a time when you're talking about European integration, you're talking about individual countries that have stood together for decades and centuries potentially breaking apart. What's happening there? Yeah, I mean, I think this is sort of fundamentally a function of the end of the Cold War, that there were a lot of divisions in Europe that were held together as it was pressed between America and, um, and, and Russia. Uh, and, and this is most, a most profound problem in Spain at the moment. Again, I was told by a colleague of conversation they had with a, a German, a senior German official who put the crisis down in one phrase, and excuse my language, this, uh, the phrase was, why should Germany pay for the fucking Spanish when the Catalans won't pay for them? And that is a pretty, you know, the, the Catalans now um, are seeking extra independence, well, either devolution or more independence from Spain. Um, and it is, it's an awkward question to try to answer, that if you don't have solidarity within one country, then how can you expect it across a continent? And I think this whole crisis has shown that, you know, that, that maybe the architects of the European ideal were too quick to assume that national identities could be transcended. And you even see this in the explanations for the crisis, where you know, they're all national stereotypes. The Northern Europeans tend to see this as a crisis based in feckless Southern Europeans who don't want to work and are all sort of cheating the welfare state. The Southern Europeans tend to think this is a crisis that's born of tight-fisted Northern Europeans. Sometimes the French and the English come together to blame the Germans. Sometimes the German and the French get together to blame Anglo-Saxon capitalism. So within all of that, you've got a, 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 the strength of these national identities, even if some of them are splintering from below. Uh, sort of is at the root of why this, why this crisis is so difficult to, to solve. All right, I think the bell has gone, but I am going to just pay, perhaps get a one-word answer from you. Five years from now, does the euro survive, yes or no? I think so. Uh, it's not to be taken for granted because a number of decisions have to be made for this to be the case, okay. but um, it's not too late. I think so, you said. Okay. It, yes, I think it will. It will survive? Yeah. All right, thank you both so much for joining us. One day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners. 
Thank <laughs> you.